to be a gunny sacker. And what you do when you gunny sacks, you have this big gunny sack, and every time there's an injustice, you put one in your sack. See, and over the years, it may take years to get the sack filled, but over the years, you collect injustices. And finally, one day, the sack's full. People tell you when their sack's full. They say, that's it! I've had all of this I'm going to take! And they start screaming and hollering and raging. And see, it's like even God would give you a guilt-free anger now because you've had so many injustices. But that was the kind of, that was the only way I knew how to do with anger. I was terrified of anger. I was manipulated by anger. And so I would go for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then all of a sudden I just go crazy. Well, see, what that does to children is they can't trust you anymore. How can you build intimacy when you never know what this guy's going to do? You know, for six weeks, he's been the Mr. Wonderful. And then all of a sudden, he's Genghis Khan, uh, <laughs> screaming and hollering and raging. And, you know, and I've talked about rage. I have been working for 10 years on rage as an addiction. I am addicted to rage. Rage was a way that I mood altered. It was a way that I got out of my feelings. It was a way that I could get out of my feelings and feel powerful when I didn't know what to do. And it's very abusive to children. Rage is very abusive to children. If you don't believe that, watch somebody screaming at somebody else. Stand there and listen to it. You know, somebody outside of your own domain. I heard a guy do it in an airport the other day. And I just can't believe that I could have ever thought that that was a useful way to be. So rage is very abusive. Name calling, comparing. When are you, you know, why can't you be like you? Why can't you be like? Why can't you be like? You're never going to be like. You're never. See, see remember, we're, we're these precious, unrepeatable people. Who are they comparing us to? And every time I do a workshop, I tell people, now be careful of your tendency to shame yourself with comparisons. So, so you're at the lecture and you look over and she's taking copious notes. And a little voice goes on in your head going, oh God, I'm not getting it. Look at all the notes she's taking. I couldn't possibly be getting as much as she is because she's taking many more notes than I am. And, or, or we do workshops. We do healing the inner child. And, and people don't discharge as much as others and think they get it wrong. Because, see, we're always comparing ourselves. The worst thing of all, the thing that shames people the most of all is perfectionism. Perfectionism is what put, puts people down because you're always having to compare to some norm and you never measure up. If any of you are a Judeo-Christian tradition, that's why the law can't save anybody because it's always the law that you're comparing yourself to and, 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 and that's not what it was about. What it was about is I love you unconditionally. Yahweh loved his people unconditionally. Unconditional forgiveness. Build a new ark. Put a mark on Cain. Just keep the thing going. Uh, let them know that I love them. And, and so that's the kind of thing. Now, once all this abandonment, shame-based modeling happens, then a person over a period of time becomes shame-based. Now, when you're shame-based, you feel deep down like you're flawed and defective as a human being. And you have to develop mood alteration. See, because to be inside of me is just too painful. So I've got to alter my mood. And that's where you understand addiction as the basis of all, I mean, shame is the basis of all addiction. See, shame is self-rupture. When you're shame-based, you're not even in yourself anymore. I become an object to myself. A shame-based, a lot of times I can be talking to somebody, and it's almost like there's somebody else here watching. And, and this person's very critical. This person will say, you know, you're, you're, you're sloppy, you know, your stomach's hanging out over your pants. So, nip, 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 nip. I mean, it's like a little chatter going on in there. These voices going on in there, shaming you. Or, or you walk away from meeting somebody, and a voice goes, boy, what a clutch you are. You know, uh, uh, boy, that, that was nice. Well, I mean, you were really cool, weren't you? You spit on yourself while you were talking. Uh, you know, and, and, and so it, it's terrible. 
And, and you see, what happens is that gradually these voices become internalized. And then if you feel a feeling, they get shamed. If you feel anger, you feel shame. If you feel sadness, you feel shame. If you feel joy, too much joy, you feel shame. You become shame-bound. I've just finished another book called Healing the Shame That Binds You because we become bound in shame. So anytime you feel a feeling, you feel shame. Then if you had shame-based parents, they were needy. So whenever you were needy, they shamed you. I would be willing to bet any of you from a dysfunctional family, the most painful times in your life come from when you were the most needy. And think about that. Because what happens if you have a needy, shame-based parent, when you are needy, they get angry. They get angry. And it's like they will shame you even more. So your most excruciating times will be the times when you were the neediest. Or, or if some of you are in recovery and you go to your parents even now and try to get some support, if they haven't come, gone into recovery, if they aren't working on their shame, they haven't done anything to heal their shame, they will be the roughest on you when you are the neediest. You see, so, so you get all your needs shamed. And there's a lot of us that when we're needy, we feel shamed. Men, culturally, sex roles, we feel a lot of shame often if we're, if we're needy. There's more permission in women in this society for women to be needy. But for men to be needy, gosh. One of the greatest things in my life is a male share, share group that I am in where we talk about being afraid. We talk about being sad. We cry in front of each other. It's been one of the most healing things in my life. Because what I needed in my life more than anything was a father. My father was a sick guy. He was abandoned by his father. He abandoned me. I felt worthless. My father didn't want me. I never saw my grandfather one day of my life. Uh, I didn't even know I had sadness about that until recently. But, but see, for a child, then you feel ashamed. If you've never been loved by a man, how can you love yourself as a man? And how can I love a woman as a man if I don't love myself as a man? So it's been very healing. But in order to get well from shame, you've got to come out of hiding. You've got to come out of hiding. There is no recovery from toxic shame unless you're willing to come out of hiding. That's why the 12-step programs have worked so well. You know, people walk in these programs, they say, my name is Joe, I'm an alcoholic. My name is Mary, I'm a eating, I have an eating disorder. My name is Sydney, I'm a sex addict. What are they doing? They're coming out of hiding. The only way out is through. The only way out. In order to heal the pain, you have to embrace the pain. That's the great paradox. Although it's something all the religious masters have said. Buddha's first noble truth was that life is suffering. Jesus said there's no resurrection without crucifixion. Uh, the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt before they went to the promised land. See, I don't know why the world's that way. I'd have saved the world with tennis and golf and nice meals myself, but it uh, doesn't seem to be that way. It seems to be that, that you've got to be willing to come out of hiding. In 12-step programs, you go in there and tell them your worst stuff, and they all give you their phone numbers. Uh, <laughs> and then, by, you know, they, 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 they tell you they love you. It's the only, you know, the only it's the requirement for membership is you have to be screwed up. I like that in a club. Uh, so, so, how, how do we heal the shame that binds us? A and what do we do? You see, the shame is the issue. If we want to prevent addiction, because an addict feels worthless. And remember, there's a great difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is, I made a mistake. Shame is, I am a mistake. Guilt is, what I did was no good. Shame is, I am no good. See, shame is irremedial. Shame is about being. Guilt is about doing. You can heal guilt because you can do something different. But what can I do if I'm flawed and defective as a human being? 